What do you say to people that, that will make the argument that uh, colonialism or um, imperialism inspired development in African countries? I would say they were wrong. They were, they were a lie. It's no, it's no uh, uh, I mean, the, the, there are fundamental problems with the question, number one. The, the question uh, about development, number one, is a problem. Because when you say development, you have to, people have to explain to you what they mean by development. What do you mean by development? And uh, in most Europeans' minds, when they're talking about development, they are talking about becoming like them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when they say imperialism and colonialism inspired development in Africa, and they say, what do you mean? Well, what they're saying to you is that colonialism and imperialism inspired Africans to be more like Europeans. That's what development means to them in every way. But that's a wrong question. And the answer to it is not that colonialism or imperialism inspired Africa. In fact, colonialism and imperialism destroyed Africa. This podcast came to be because I want to reignite discussions about Pan-Africanism. And the purpose is to plant seeds of unity and inspiration among Africans, both at home and in the diaspora. I believe we have come to the stage where our continent is more vulnerable than ever. And it's up to us to decide our fate moving forward. What we will come to realize, I hope, is that we're so much more alike than we're different. And this show it's just a small contribution to the public discourse that is going on in Africa right now. My name is Soshima Iro, and this is the Pan-African Experience. On today's episode, I'll be joined by Dr. Molefi Kete Asante to talk about post-colonial legacies and the United States of Africa. Dr. Asante was a professor of the Department of Africology at Temple University from 1984 to 1993 and the chair of the department from July 2013 to date. He is a guest professor of cultural and discourse studies at Zhejiang University in China from 2007 to date. He is a professor extraordinarius at University of South Africa's Institute for African Renaissance from 2009 to date. He is the editor of Journal of Black Studies from 1969 to date. He is the president of Mole Fikete Asante Institute, Philadelphia from 2011 to date. A board member of Tabo Mbeki Institute Leadership Council, University of South Africa from 2012 to date. He is the author of numerous books including Afrocentricity, African Pyramid of Knowledge and Radical Insurgencies. We will be joined briefly by Dr. Nah Dove. Dr. Dove is an author and assistant professor in the Department of Africology and African American Studies, also at Temple University. I am very grateful and honored to have them on the show. Okay, Dr. Molefi Asante, uh, welcome to the Pan-African Experience. Thank you very much. Very, very, very happy to be here. Okay, I'm a little bit curious, you know, you have a Ghanaian name and uh, you were installed as a king in Ghana. I just was wondering what your connection is uh, to, to Ghana. Well, it was, well, it's very, very interesting uh, that you would ask that question but, because I have a Pan-African name. My, I am uh, definitely Pan-African in, in every respect. Um, my name, uh, Molefi, is actually Suto. It's from uh, Southern Africa. And it uh, literally means, I mean, many means several things, but it literally means one who keeps the traditions. And then the name Kete Asante, of course, you know, is Ghanaian. And uh, the King Opoku Wari II, uh, many years ago, 1972, uh, said to me that uh, he thought that was my name uh, because I loved the Kete drums, the royal drums of uh, the Asante Haini. And, uh, and that uh, Asante was a common name, as common as any European name. So w why shouldn't you have an African name? So uh, he gave me Kete Asante. And I was born on Friday, and he gave me Kofi. So my name is Kofi Kete Asante. But later on, uh, I discovered uh, when they did the DNA analysis that my background was actually uh, Nigerian, Yoruba. 
uh, and also uh, uh, Sudanese uh, from uh, the Halfa region. So now uh, I have a uh, Yoruba name, Adewale. I don't have uh, I don't have a, a Nubian name yet, but one day maybe I'll get a name from Sudan as well. So my mother's family is, uh, goes back to Sudan. My father's goes back to Yoruba and Nigeria. So uh, that's why I say it's a Pan African name. So uh, it's an African name. I, I certainly, uh, when I grew up in Georgia in the U.S., the name that they had attached to me was Arthur Smith, but um, I don't look like a Smith in English, and I don't um, have a, uh, I, I'm, I don't have any relationship to King Arthur of, of England, uh, UK, something like that. I, I, so that name did not fit me at all. So uh, I have a proper name, Moleficete Asati. <laughs> okay. I, so that gives you the history. So people now know the history. Okay. Yeah. We have the guest now. I will admit. Uh, I will, uh, is Backed it up? Hello. Hello. Welcome. Oh, that's that's... Welcome to the Pan African Experience. It's an honor. Thank you. Please, Thank uh, you. please, can you introduce yourself uh, for us? Yes. Um, I'm Dr. Nardov. I'm a faculty member at the Temple. Um, Department of Africology, um, and I work with Dr. Asante, and um, I, I'm I'm an an, an Africologist. Okay. Uh, uh, do you want more than that? Is no, it, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, yeah. I, okay. I just wanted to talk about uh, post-colonial legacies and the United States of Africa. You know, however, you know, we cannot really talk about uh, post-colonial legacy or the United States of uh, Africa without um, talking about what led us to start seeking this unification or, or renaissance. And, uh, you know, we, um, everyone is familiar with the the uh, the abolition of slave trade which gradually ushered in imperialism and colonialism and all this stems from the uh, the berlin conference 1984-85 you know where i believe the fate of africa was sealed and uh, dr center i was wondering if you can you know talk a little bit about those period and the uh, what surrounded the, the berlin conference and the impact you know it's still having on africa till now uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let me, uh, that's a, is a very good uh, starting, uh, it's a relatively good starting point. I, I normally like to start uh, a little earlier than that. Okay. And <laughs> because, uh, because I think that what led up to 1884 and 85, the Berlin Conference, uh, had a lot to do uh, with the death of Sonny Ali Bear, uh, who had, in a sense, uh, been the last... Uh, of the great kings uh, uh, to of Songhai to uh, to basically organize a a defense of the western part of Africa. Uh, there had been in, in, inroads into Africa by imperialism from the east uh, even earlier than uh, the 14th and 15th centuries, but uh, it was the uh, when people sometimes say 1492. Uh, they talk about uh, Columbus and the Americas, but actually when I think of 1492, I think of the death of Sonny Ali Bear, that that was a great event that uh, opened up the floodgates of the western part of the continent of Africa to European exploration. And after Africans had been in uh, the Iberian Peninsula uh, for six or 700 years, uh, then there was uh, almost, in, a, in some senses, a literal sense, a payback. Uh, the fact that Africans had, uh, had stayed in um, uh, what became Portugal and what became Spain, uh, Spain for um, those hundreds of years as actually participants in the jihads of the uh, of Islam uh, as Moors, the word Moor meaning uh, black people who had adopted 
uh, Islam. Uh, this was a different uh, term than they used for Arabs back then. Uh, for Arabs, they used the term Saracen, uh, S-A-R-A-C-E-N. But for the, um, uh, the Moors, uh, the Moors were people from uh, uh, northern and western Africa who had adopted Islam and had uh, became, became the major force in the invasion and intrusion into Europe through the uh, Iberian Peninsula. So that went on for, uh, as I said, 700 years, when you include um, the fact that in 1492, also, this was the end of that regime uh, because um, Africans were basically uh, uh, defeated and had to leave uh, the Iberian Peninsula. They had to leave uh, earlier Portugal around 1150 or something uh, uh, around one of those dates. But uh, it was two or 300 years later before Africans left Spain. So what this meant then was that the west coast of Africa became a place uh, for a scramble in terms of uh, European powers. There were only two major seafaring powers at that time in Europe. One was Portugal and the other one was Spain. And uh, to a large degree, Italy, of course, uh, uh, at least some of the cities like Geno Geno Genoa uh, had some uh, power, but not much. So it was basically uh, from Lisboa uh, and uh, from uh, Spain that we began to get this great contest for the scramble of Africa. And they divided up among themselves because they were both Catholic nations. And this is, again, you've had the, the Islamic intrusion into Southern Europe. Now you have the Catholic intrusion into West Africa uh, where they felt like uh, there was a lot of gold coming from West Africa. And they had discovered that there was gold uh, coming from West Africa uh, they had discovered that there was gold coming from West Africa because of the fact that they saw the, the Africans in Spain and in Portugal with so much gold. And they decided that, hey, wait a minute, let's go and find some of that gold. So there was this contest. And there was that also that issue uh, of the blockade of the overland route uh, to the east from the Europeans uh, because they had been... Uh, blocked again by the Islamic forces in crossing uh, uh, Eastern Europe and going uh, to India and going trying to get to the East for what they considered to be spices. So there were all these entanglements, political, commercial, and so forth. So then Africa is open. You get the exploitation of uh, the African continent uh, with the, in uh, 1441, with the taking of Africans from the Senegal region to Lisboa and presenting them to the king. These are some Africans we picked up and we brought them here. You know, you can see these are the people they have there. This pattern had gone on um, uh, sporadically for uh, hundreds of years anyway. And they also had had the presence of Africans in other parts of Europe by virtue of the Arab uh, enslavement of Africans from the eastern part of the continent. So, so I, I guess the point that I want to make is that, uh, so the, the contest, the contest in uh, West Africa had become extremely uh, chaotic uh, because of the Europeans fighting to get territory for gold, uh, for human resources, and and uh, for materials and so on. So they, 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 there was always fighting and faction. What they decided was that the Catholic Church should decide, the Pope should decide. The Pope should decide what area the Portuguese should be in, what area the Spanish should be in. And ultimately the Dutch got entered. entered. And then of course the English also entered. So you got the Dutch, the English, the Spaniards, the Portugal, Portuguese, they're all entering this. The Pope steps in and says, look, in order for you to have territory in Africa, you have to sign an asiento, 
A-S-I-E-N-T-O, an asiento. And most of us don't understand this word asiento, but it was extremely powerful in the contest for Africa because, uh, for Europe, is contest for Africa because uh, how would you, if you were a Portuguese, how, how would you know not to take a, a certain area in Ghana or Nigeria or, uh, or Senegal or whatever? You, you would know that because you could present uh, to the raiding party, you could present to them an asiento, some uh, 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 a charter that had been given to you by the Pope that says, this is your territory. They can go further up the coast or further down the coast, but you can't come here. We have the asiento for this. And the asiento not only gave money to the Pope, because a certain amount of money, particularly for this slave trade, went to the Catholic Church. This is why the Catholic Church is so deeply in, involved in the whole process of the enslavement of Africans from the West Coast of Africa. So what this led to was that many people felt like they need to get involved in Africa. And you remember uh, the uh, Belgium was too small to get involved but the king of Belgium, Leopold, he got involved. And of course, he had a, a big uh, uh, to do uh, in the Congo, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and which he took actually from the Portuguese, because Portuguese had had some uh, contact with the kings of Congo. Um, so you got the, the French become involved, and they get involved in, the, in, uh, in Sudan as well as in uh, Brazzaville, uh, Congo, and in West Africa, they uh, take the foreign legion and they get involved. So you got all these nations and that's when they decided then after so many years that they've got to have a conference in Berlin to decide how we are going to operate on the continent of Africa. And you are correct to point this out by talking about that Berlin conference, because now we come to the Berlin conference, there are 13 nations involved in the Berlin conference, and there are uh, a couple of nations that are observers. One of the observers is the United States. The other observer is uh, Turkey. So those are the two countries that observe a status, and the other countries are fighting for portions of Africa. And uh, this conference starts in uh, uh, November of 1884, and it ends in February of 1885. And that's why we call it the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 85. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the, the, the main leader of it, the main pusher for it was Germany, because of course, Belgium uh, had uh, uh, no uh, national interest in it, but it had a uh, the king's interest in it. He, he, he was interested in this conference and, and he was the one uh, to a large degree that said, wait a minute, we really want to have, uh, we, we want to get this thing together. We want to uh, create uh, a system that we could have where each nation, each European nation can define its own interests. And, and, and they, the, the main principle, and I won't go through all of this, but the main principle was the sphere of influence. That was what they were called. They, 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 they took a, a big image of Africa, sort of uh, uh, like you would put a, a table and you would have a whole construction of a map of Africa in front of the conference room. And each nation had to make a case for why it should have a particular part of the African continent. This is why they used to call it the African cake. It's like, you know, okay, we've got a big cake here. We, we all can partake of it. Now, no African, what I always, what amazes me, no African leader, no African person was there to say, oh, no, you can't have this. This is my ancestors' home. No, it was all Europeans. They're sitting around and say, okay, this is, the, this is the map of Africa. What do you want? And then, of course, they had to negotiate between uh, each other. This is why the, the British and the Germans negotiated about mountains in uh, East Africa. Uh, and, and, and they ended up with the British um, taking Mount Kenya and the, um, and the Germans taking Kilimanjaro. So this, this is 
they, they said, well, you can't have two mountains. You can only have one tall mountain. So they did all of this kind of stuff. You can't have this river. You can only have that river and so forth. But the sphere of influence, the, 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 and, and, and Europe has always been very good at making laws, even bad laws. But they, 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 they know law. This is, um, this is the inheritance of the Romans. This concept, you know, and, and people forget sometimes what Rome was good at was making laws. That's the thing. And the laws were, were, were bad. It's just like in the United States. They make a lot of laws in the United States. They made a lot of laws uh, during the period of race, uh, deep racism and segregation. Segregation was legal. This is not, it's like apartheid was legal. It was a law. It, they, they believe in law. That because something is law doesn't mean it's correct or moral or just or ethical. It's a law. So Europe made laws about Africa. They said, if you have had a, an explorer who happens to go up a river in a particular part of Africa and talk to a king, then that part belongs to If you are French, that part belongs to France. That's a French. That's France. If you, if you establish a missionary uh, point, on the coast of Nigeria in such and such a year, and your mission, your establishment of that post was earlier than the establishment on, on, uh, by, uh, by, the, by the French or the Dutch, then that belongs to you. So, so the sphere of influence was the doctrine. That was the law. So you had to prove, this is what the 1884-85 conference was. It had to set the boundaries. And in the, in the case of uh, Leopold, he had the whole of the Congo, which was like 80 times the size of Belgium. He, but he was personally, that was his personal fiefdom. The whole of Congo, I mean, you can imagine, Congo, to put it, I mean, you in Scotland, but to put it in perspective, uh, the uh, Congo is the size of, uh, of the United States of America, uh, east of the Mississippi River. If you take all the, all the states of the United States, east of the Mississippi River, that's the size of Congo. It's massive. And one man, one European man owned all of that. That was his. Everything that came out of there, all the rubber, all the timber, it belonged, all the ivory, uh, all that belonged to Leopold. So that's what they settled in 1884. And then they settled the boundaries for all the other nations. Germany would take so much. Uh, Germany would take uh, Namibia, what became Namibia. Um, uh, the, the, the British would take South Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's how it, it so, so that 1880, I'm sorry it takes so long, but the 1884 conference is pivotal and it's good that you bring it up. But always remember, that Africa would have been better protected had we had strong empires or nations in the West that would have prevented the inroads coming from Europe. What do you say to people that, that will make the argument that uh, colonialism or imperialism inspired development in African countries? I would say they were wrong. They were, they were lying. There's no... It's no uh, I mean, there the, are the fundamental problems with the question, number one. The, the question uh, about development, number one, is a problem. Because when you say development, you have to, people have to explain to you what they mean by development. What do you mean by development? And uh, in most Europeans' minds, when they're talking about development, they are talking about becoming like them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when they say, Imperialism and colonialism inspired development in Africa. Is it? What do you mean? Well, what they're saying to you is that colonialism and imperialism inspired Africans to be more like Europeans. That's what development means to them in every way. But that's a wrong question. And the answer to it is not that colonialism or imperialism inspired Africa. In fact, colonialism and imperialism destroyed Africa. And in fact, um, this is very interesting because I was speaking in Ghana at Achimoto School, which is a very important school in Ghana. 
in uh, Accra. Uh, and a, a young lady who was maybe 16 or 17 years of age stood up and she said to me, Professor Rosanti, uh, do you think that if uh, Europeans had not come to Africa, uh, we, would, we, we would be uh, civilized? And I said to her young daughter, uh, the fact that Europeans came to Africa meant that we would definitely be uncivilized. I said, right now, you drive through Accra and you see people with walls in their houses and they have glass at the top of the walls to keep people from climbing over. I said, before Europe came to Africa, you could leave your door unlocked. Nobody would come into your house to steal from you. But soon as we took European culture, everybody has a look, you gotta lock up. Because there is these material possessions in people's minds that they would have. But in a sense, uh, one may say that what would bring about a true renaissance in Africa would be if African people reinterpret and re-examine and re-interrogate their own cultures. What's, what, what were we like before Europe? What did we think? What were the values that held our societies together in unity without fighting each other ethnically and uh, creating uh, chaos? I mean, what, what, how did we do, how did our ancestors have a society like Ghana, ancient Ghana, that lasted from 300 BCE to 1240, this era, over 1500 years of government and civilization. How did Africans do that? How did Africans create a civilization in ancient Kemet that lasted over 3,000 years? And the solid made, this is, I mean, there were struggles, but still the consistency of the culture. What is it about African traditions and values that, that have given us that strength that we don't have under the modern systems that we inherited from Europe. That, that sort of question has always been interrogated. Don't, there's no reason why people put Africans on the spot by saying, well, would you have been developed or would we have been? No, they didn't bring us, they, they, did they bring us material things? Yes, they brought us material things, but material things are not necessarily equated with civilization. There's, there, there are societies right now uh, in uh, South America, in the forest, who don't even have a word for war. Can you imagine a modern European society not having a word for war? No, they're warring people. That's that's part of the culture, man. You get military culture. You know, you, you it's a whole different. But but who's more civilized is the question. You know, and 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 that's the thing. And. And, and I, so I don't, uh, no, I don't buy that. No, we would, we would, uh, we, and we were already in terms of material development, material development, when the enslavement occurred and the intrusion of Europe into Africa, Africa was already on the road toward its own uh, indigenous development in its own way that had been based on and modeled on its own philosophy. In fact, the Dutch wrote when they saw Benin City in Nigeria, they wrote that this city is greater than Amsterdam. They wrote that in their diaries, that the streets are wider, that the people are orderly, that the king rules with uh, a generosity. There's a whole different thing. That's what they wrote in their diaries. They were not trying to prove anything down the history. They were just talking to us about what they saw. But they didn't know they were going to talk to black people. They didn't know that I would read that and say, oh, wow, they even admitted it, right? But that's what they were doing. So the progress, the notion of, of, of uh, progress, if you talk about progress in the sense of uh, making life more convenient for people, that was already in the process when we uh, encountered the Europeans. If anything, they prevented Africa from carrying out its traditional development that would have been based on African models. 
you see. And they attempted to do this with the Japanese and the Chinese. Chinese were a little more resilient. The, the Japanese were still resilient as well. So that, so that Europe entered, but Europe was held at bay. European culture was held at bay. The Japanese didn't take, it, take everything the Europeans gave. They said, no, no, no. You're not going to come over here and take our parks away from us. We're the ones who created beautiful parks. And you're not going to give us your English gardens. No, we, we got our own spaces of meditation and quiet. You're not going to give us your religion either. We got our own religion. You can keep your religion and have it yourself. That's fine. But don't come in here and try to take us. But in our case, by force, they were able to force us into situations where many of us accepted uh, uh, the uncivil uh, activities of Europe. Okay, so uh, Dr. Sante, I was uh, born in a Catholic uh, home. You know, I was raised uh, Catholic. And, uh, you know, I often have this discussion with my mother, who is uh, a very strong uh, Catholic. And uh, uh, she's a retired midwife, you know, well-educated as well. So I was wondering, I always struggle to reconcile, you know, what I know with regards to colonization and the, 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 the impact that the Roman Catholic Church has with regards to colonizing Africa and then reconciling it with my faith as a Christian. You know, I don't know if you're a Christian or not, but how do you reconcile this? The idea that the Roman Catholic Church participated fully uh, in uh, whether it's slave trade or some form of colonization. How do you reconcile this? Well, I hear, here's the way, uh, and your, your, your first name is uh, uh, Sochima. First name is Sochima. Uh, Hero, yes. So, so, Chima. so Chima, uh, here's the way I, I reconcile it. I, I think that a conquest is itself uh, the fundamental issue. Uh, and uh, you, you have a very good mother and a very wonderful mother. Uh, mothers are always wonderful in many instances, nurturing and so on. And she cares about you, obviously. So that's important. But, but here's the thing with my mother, your mother, and, and all the African mothers, that when you are conquered, you always uh, are forced by habit or by uh, employment or, uh, or, or per persecution or, or, or uh, discrimination to accept the conqueror's way. If you show me a person's religion, I will show you their conqueror. That is the key to what, how religion operates because religion is the deification of nationalisms. And white nationalism is always white supremacy. It is never, I mean, we, we wouldn't even consider, I mean, we never even think about black supremacy. That's not even a term that we, could, we even say. That's not an African ideology but but there are people who have this notion you see that uh, that that uh, so for me uh, uh, all religions whether it's Islam Judaism Christianity Hindu um, uh, uh, now uh, Buddhism which is many black they're black Americans who say they're Buddhists that's sort of like we're Buddhists right all those religions indicate to me, that you are dislocated psychologically and culturally, that you somehow are off of your own terms, that you are not following the traditional terms that would have given you a more solid traditional sense. And certainly you're not following classical African uh, value systems that are based on the ancient systems that we see along the Nile River, uh, such as Ma'at, uh, from Kemet, from ancient Kemet, uh, because most people don't realize that ancient Egypt was a black civilization. It's not an Arab civilization. The Arabs are late to Africa. The, the, the Arabic is not an African language. It was not uh, spoken by uh, our ancestors in, uh, in Egypt. They, they spoke uh, Chikam. They spoke the language of Kemet. They, they spoke what we call Merodetra, the beautiful language. So they, th this, this is a, a, the language of the gods, divine speech. That's what they spoke. They, they didn't speak 
Arabic. They didn't speak uh, Scottish. They didn't speak English. They didn't speak any of these languages, you know, German. They didn't do that. So my my thing with with uh, all these religions, whether it's Catholic, whether it is Muslim, is that they are not our uh, traditions. And if they come in, what they what they do is actually take our brains and turn our brains so that our brains start, uh, you know, thinking that perhaps they are closer to God. And I don't think they're closer to my God. In fact, they're farther away from my God because they're the ones who enslaved us. They're the ones who crippled our nations. They're the ones who taught us against our tradition. Can you imagine what happened to when the missionaries came? The missionaries come into our village and we have a village that has been going on for 2000 years where we have a, a set that there are, uh, there's a place for the elders and a place for different age groups. We, we created age group circles. That was the African way, right? And we, we had uh, gender uh, roles and activities that people had, that was an African way. The European comes in, European says, this little boy who is 10 years old is smarter than his grandfather who is 80 years old because this little boy knows the Bible. And we're going to put this little boy up in front of the group in the village to teach the elders about Jesus. That's insane. But that's what happened to us. They, they destroyed the system of behavior and morality and the, the legal uh, structure. Whether it was, whether it, it didn't always create, it didn't always produce good outcomes, but at least was a structure in place that elders were respected. And even if you disagreed with an elder, ultimately, I mean, one day you had to remember you would be an elder, you see? And you respected your ancestors because when you, when you got old, you wanted your children to respect you. And you respected your ancestors because you saw yourself giving sacrifice and doing rituals for your ancestors because one day when you die, you want your, your children to do rituals for you. This was the Africa, it was clear, it was simple. Europe destroyed that. So we have to be careful about these churches and about these mosques and all that stuff. And so you ask, what am I? I'm an African. My religion is African. I try to do the, be the best African I could be in culture. That's my own my thing. Not, and it's not, not, and I always say that it's not based on my ethnicity, it's not based on my color or complexion, it's based on my deep, deep belief and the values that Africa has given to the world. I used to visit a, a church in uh, Scotland here, and when you go into this church, it's a Roman Catholic church, there is a, a painting an old painting of uh, Jesus Christ, and is not the blonde eye, you know, uh, the blonde hair, mm -hmm. blue eye Jesus. It's, it's like a Jesus mm -hmm. of a darker complexion, and this is old, in, uh, old yes. painting. So that even reminds me of the idea of imagery, the the fact that you know in Africa the Jesus Christ we see is the blonde hair, blue eye Jesus. That does something to the psyche of an African yes. person, whereby if you start watching documentaries now, if there's any Western person, uh, white person that comes to Africa, there's, you know, this ceremony, they will orchestrate this ceremony, you know, dancing and singing around. I'm like, you know, I was born in Nigeria, grew up in Nigeria, we'll never bring out drum and start dancing for a documentary maker ever, you know? Yes. So that yes. psyche is what I'm hoping, you know, uh, with the help of people like you, I'm hoping to use this podcast to start having this discussion, you know, uh, it, almost like an intellectual revolution for people to start thinking about, you know, what has happened in the past and how we can start having uh, discussions like this to start rebuilding Africa intellectually, you know, from that point of view. Well, we, we call that's a very good, it's a brilliant mission for you. And we call that Afrocentricity. And Afrocentricity simply means that we see things from the perspective of African culture. 
that we, we, we listen to, our, we interrogate things. If you ask me a question, the first thing that runs through my mind, if you ask me religion, the first thing that runs through my mind is what did Africans conceive of? If you ask me anything, what about architect, architecture? The first thing that runs through my mind is Africa. I'm not, it doesn't mean that I, I'm not denying that other people have their thing, but I have mine too. And mine is just as valuable as yours, you see. And I'm going to ask Dr. Dove if she, Dr. Dove, if you want to add anything, please feel free. Dr. Dove please. teaches in our department here, and um, and she grew up in uh, Nigeria and uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, her family is part of her family is from Ghana. So so she she's one of our leading Afrocentric scholars. So uh, I, I just if she want to say anything. Please add to help me out. Dr. Asante, you don't need any help. I can do <laughs> Thank you. Thank but, you very much. Um, I'm honored to be, you know, working with you, learning from you and growing from you. And to add to what you've said, when we look at Africa and we use um, and we use the Afrocentric way of analyzing what's going on, we're very uh, we use culture as a tool of analysis because we recognize that there are cultural distinctions among humanity which really are so very different and um, that the genetic based differences that are false that have been imposed upon our minds um, are problematic and very dangerous. Um, millions of, of African people have been murdered throughout the centuries as a result of a belief in uh, the inhumanity or the, or, or the debasement and demonization of African people. And uh, we look at these cultural distinctions where one culture can look at another group of people and decide that they're not actually people, take their lands and then impose their values on those people through all the institutions necessary that would uphold any um, society, any culture, because all the, the institutions are all culturally based. And so when we even look at the idea of uh, a spiritual system, it's people who create those systems through their cultural beliefs and values, what is, what is appropriate for them. So they will create cultures that love their humanity. And we're living right now in, in uh, a, 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 a European and Arabic cultures and so on that despise African humanity and actually create hierarchies based on skin color and who, of who we are. And, um, but when we look at the African origin of humanity and we look at the many um, spiritual ideas that were created in Africa, we actually can see a relationship between the early, early ideas of, of African people and they have been written. When we go to places like Kemet, we can see that they have actually been written. So we know it in writing and we're learning it in the things that people have done and the images that they've left behind over the thousands of years. And we see that these modern religions that despise African people, African humanity, are all based on the principles that Africa gave them in the first place. But because their cultures are different, they've never really been able to use them correctly in their cultures. So, you know, for an African, uh, we can look at the principles of my art and we can see that the culture, African culture, is always trying to base itself on the principles which are truth and honesty and righteousness and reciprocity and justice and those kinds of principles. That's why they've lasted for thousands of years. And then we, we look at the conquerors who have written these modern texts um, of religion, which uh, can never carry out those principles that they learned from Africa because their 
they're not based on the principles of Africa. For instance, if we look at male-female reciprocity in Africa, the equality between the woman and the man, you will be judged by what you produce in the world and not how you look or what your gender is, those types of principles. They're ensconced in religious ideals, these modern religions, but they're not practiced. They can't be practiced because they begin, the ones Dr. Asante has spoken about, the Hebraic, the, the uh, Islamic, the Brahmanism, the Christianity, they're based on the demonization of the uh, woman, the first woman, the mother of humanity. And, um, you know, so that that is the first, that's the first hierarchy and the first injustice. Well, if that is the foundation of your society, how are you going to practice the principles of, of um, democracy or uh, love or reciprocity or balance or truth. You can't do that because your truth is that you um, are uh, a hierarchical dominating um, um, culture. You belong to that. Your way of, of existing in the world is to take other people's cultures and use it for your own um, profit or for your own building of your own culture. This is just rough. I know what I've said, but no, um, it's just to show that, that mm -hmm. people differ culturally, not genetically, but culturally. And from, this is what we keep developing in, in Africology. We keep on looking for the evidence to show. We have much evidence to show that, but we keep building and doing research in these areas to strengthen our knowledge and um, you know Dr. Asante has created the opportunity for us to actually go into who we actually are and therefore the potential of who we might become which is completely in opposition to all the conquerors. So okay. Shima, and I, I should add to that that's a brilliant uh, statement but I should add to it that Dr. Uh, Dove has also published the book Afrocentric School and she's also published the book, African Mothers. And also uh, she uh, authored with me the book, Being Human Being, Transforming the Race Discourse, which is a very popular book now in the United States. So it may be something that your viewers may want to get. Being Human Being, not, not being human beings, but being human being, transforming the race discourse. By Asante and Dab. Definitely, Dab, I, I would love the opportunity to uh, talk with her on those uh, on those areas. So yes, yes, that's very good. Thank you. Okay, in one of your lectures, you mentioned that uh, Pan Africanism is slightly, you know, uh, ambiguous, which I agree with because the, the, the definition is often subjective, and you refer to negritude and Afrocentrism as you know you already talked about Afro Afrocentrism as the two ideological movement, uh, you know, Africa's consciousness. So I was wondering why, you know, why do you believe that, uh, you know, Pan-Africanism, the, the, the ambiguity there, and then how, why the Afrocentricity is the best way to conceptualize what we're trying to do? Okay, well, there are a couple of reasons. But the first one is that uh, Pan-Africanism, as I have seen it, is essentially, um, is, uh, uh, it's underdeveloped in the sense of theory. Uh, when we talk about Pan-Africanism, it's normally a slogan. Uh, I believe in Pan-Africanism, I'm a Pan-Africanist, uh, and I, I, I tell people I'm a Pan-Africanist, I am. But what does it mean for me or for you or for the next person? Uh, do we have the same understanding of Pan-Africanism? If, if a person says to me I'm a Marxist, I have a pretty general idea of what she believes. Because in Marxists, there are certain sort of theoretical things, certain sort of methodological things that people adhere to. And I can sort of read the first three or four pages of a person's paper if they say they're Marxist, and I can see if I don't see class analysis, if I don't see contradictions, if I don't see, then I, I say, oh, well, no, they, they're not, they may not be in the Marxists, you see? We can't do that with Pan-Africanism. 
And the reason we can't do it is because we don't, we have not yet set up the robust theory of what Pan-Africanism is. It doesn't mean that we haven't written books on Pan-Africanism. We have outstanding intellectuals. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ali, we have many people who have written deep books on the history of Pan-Africanism, on the discussion of Pan-Africanism, on how Pan-Africanism can be articulated. But what is it, what, what are the, uh, what's the substantive meaning of this? And that's why we come to Afrocentricity. We say that in order for, in order for Pan-Africanism to function, it needs an engine. And the engine of Pan-Africanism is the theoretical and philosophical tools that are at the heart of Afrocentricity. And if you get those tools right, in terms of the agency of African people, if you interpret things from the standpoint of African cultural uh, uh, narratives, you, you can create Pan-Africanism on that basis. You can have a solid foundation, but it's difficult to create uh, Pan-Africanism when people say that my, my religion is more important than my political ideology, you see? Because, because then you have a situation where you got Muslims and you got Christians arguing over what forms of Pan-African be. With, with, when you're an African like me, you don't have those arguments. We just, I'm, I'm just for an African agency. I want African cultural values to, to, exp, to, 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 to reach out. Now, will that mean every African will ever be Pan-Africanist in that sense? No. But the idea of Africa being one and being together, not one based on ethnicity, not one based on region, but one based on the idea that there is nothing wrong with Africa being itself. And that if I am an African person, there's nothing wrong with me expressing the views and the cultural attitudes of my ancestors. There's nothing, and nobody can ever persuade me that something is wrong with my great great grandparents. You know, nobody nobody can know they 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 created their values. I am the one who did not necessarily follow what they created. I did not expand it. I did not increase it. I did not modernize it. I just let it die. I had a student, for example, she was from. Uh, Tobala Yefa was from Eastern Nigeria. She was from, um, uh, I think the, she was either Ibibi, she's an Ibibio person from Nigeria. And she came to our classes here at Temple in Afrocentricity and Africology. And one day she said, and she had lived in Switzerland, she had lived in the U.S. at Ohio. And one day she said, you know what, you have talked to me so but I'm going to go back home to uh, my family. I'm going to ask my mother to take me to the shrines. And so she went home for a school break and she goes to her mother and she says, mom, you know, yes, I've been in Switzerland for 10 years. I've been in the U.S. for four years. I'm back home now. Would you do me something? Would you take me to our ancestral shrine? And she said, my mother broke down and cried. She cried like a child. She was so happy. She, did, she said, I thought I had lost my daughter to the European way. But you, you have asked for something. She said, where do you get this? She said, Professor Asante says that we African people have abandoned our ancestors and that maybe our punishment is then we, we abandon our way and we follow. So she went and she, she said it was the greatest bond she'd ever had with her mother because that her mother understood. Because her mother was just a village person. She didn't, but she wanted her daughter to be educated. She wanted her, but she didn't want to lose her daughter in the process. That's a power, it was a powerful lesson to me. And so that's why I say 
being Afrocentric is at the core of our Africanity. It is at the core of our sense of who we are and our unity. I, I have traveled all over the continent of Africa and I've told people I'm never a stranger because I don't see, I see words that are different. I see languages that are different, but the basic values of African people is still there. We, we still greet strangers with open arms, you see? And we still offer you a glass of water or some cola nuts if you come. That, that's, that's the African way, you see. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I always say that, you know, for most of us, the, the, uh, you know, when, when we come from, uh, if we come from Africa to Europe, there are two things that can happen. Is either we become, we embrace our culture more or we completely abandon our culture. Yes. You know, I give you an example. You must be familiar with uh, Fela Nicola Pocuti. He's the musician. You yes. Know, he studies here and uh, everything. And uh, he has a Fela shrine. He doesn't believe in Christianity. He goes to his yes. own shrine and yes. does the traditional yes. stuff. He wears traditional clothes. And he also thinks about uh, colonialism and imperialism in his music because he's someone that mm -hmm. is uh, aware of uh, the, mm -hmm. this, this type of stuff. So uh, that's why I... I, I related to the story you told about the the lady that went back home and, yes uh, yes so that, thank you very much and i have to say that's how i found uh, yeah go ahead please i'm sorry i'm i must leave but i thank you very much it's thank you very much dr Dalford. thank you for thank sharing you. with us is it okay if i can get um your your details letter maybe email from dr sante and can be able to reach out yeah. to you I will, send, I will send you her email. okay thank you thank you very much Perfect. With regards to philosophical and political movements, you know, the African Renaissance, you know, emerged in the 1940s, spearheaded, you know, I believe, by uh, Sheikh Anto Diop. And my understanding is that the African Renaissance evolved into the idea of United States of Africa. You know, mm -hmm. can you give a background on African Renaissance and its evolution to uh, the United States of Africa, if that's if that's the well, case? Well, it's a very good, very good question. The, the thing is that Sheikh Anta Joe, and I was fortunate to to know him. Uh, he's our greatest African intellectual of the 20th century. There is no doubt about it. I mean, there's nobody in my estimation who is even close to him. Um, sometimes people have arguments with me and say, oh, well, Du Bois was this. I said, Du Bois was a great historian, but Sheikh Anta Jope was a great African. He was clearly uh, centered in an African context, all the time trying to advance Africa. And that's what he told me. He told me that uh, we didn't need to defend Africa. We just need to advance our African culture. We never, he said, we, we, we're always on the defensive. Why? There's no reason for Africa to be defensive. So when I was only a kid, maybe in 1940, 47 or 48 is when he wrote the essay for Présence Africaine, the, uh, the Senegalese uh, uh, magazine, when he asked the question, when shall we be able to speak of an African Renaissance? And the, what, what he was saying was that Europe always talked about they had this renaissance and that renaissance. They had this period of enlightenment and that period of enlightenment. He said, when shall we be able to talk of an African renaissance? And the answer to that question is uh, that the renaissance is not necessarily uh, uh, Afrocentric, or rather uh, uh, Pan-Africanism itself, but Pan-Africanism could be an outcome of a renaissance. But the Renaissance will come when mentally and psychologically, intellectually, we accept that Africa itself uh, is its own uh, culture and it's, it's powerful in itself. And we can do anything that anybody else in the world has done. We are, after all, the first Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, all the Homo sapiens in the world are from Africa. Um, before 70,000 years ago, Everybody in the world was black. There was no other people. There, nobody had ever migrated out of Africa until <laughs> 70,000 years ago. 70,000. So yes, Homo sapiens rise about 300,000 years ago in Africa and then migrated throughout Africa. And then 70,000 years ago, 
there were uh, Africans who left Africa to go into Asia and to go into Europe and to go around the world, even as far as Australia. That's, that's where we began to get migration. So until 70,000 years ago, all Homo sapiens were in Africa, only one continent. And we spent three fourths of the time of Homo sapiens on this earth, three fourths of the time was spent on the continent of Africa. That length of time gave us the uh, time to establish the basic rituals and models and patterns and traditions and symbols of society. We were the first ones to cross a river. We were the first ones to name God. Whatever the, whatever the language we spoke, we, we were the ones who spoke of the divine. We were the first ones. Why should I accept somebody who's, who, who left the continent, became antagonistic and hostile toward their ancestors, their mothers and fathers in Africa? Why should I accept them as being, no, there's no superiority here. There's no supremacy here. There's only uh, trickery, you see? So what I am saying about this, and I think it's extremely important that we understand this, that the Renaissance, uh, if we want to use that word, um, the ancient African classical term uh, uh, means actually they didn't use Renaissance. They, they would have used uh, the becoming again the becoming again, the becoming again. It's a Kepra notion, the notion of Kepra. So, so this notion of becoming and becoming again, if, for us is one that we look at the old values and say, how do we now bring those old values into a modern society, into a modern world? And so the evolvement into this notion of the United States of Africa or the notion of, uh, the African uh, nation uh, was one that was logical. And Sheikh Anta proved it in his book, Cultural Unity of Black Africa. And he used the word Black Africa not in a racial sense. For him, he was talking about it in a cultural sense. And that's important because he didn't give up any part of Africa. He's just like me. When I did my book called The, uh, the History of Africa, I, I included all Africa. There's no, there's no Africa, there's no white Africa. It does not exist. All Africa is black, and that's why he he wants to emphasize that ancient Egyptians were were black people. The emphasize that the people in Algeria, the people in Tunisia, the people in Morocco before the coming of the Arabs, they were all black. So there's and there are black people who still live in Libya. They're still there. The the Tubu people. There's still, in Af there's still black people in Algeria, in the desert. Black people ride camels. But most black people don't even think we rode camels. We, we ride camels. We, 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 we've been there, you see? So this notion of the United States of Africa evolved because in the 70s and 80s and 90s, we, uh, we, we had the influence of the people in the 1960s like Kwame Nkrumah, who said to us, that Africa must unite. We have to unite. And the reason Africa has to unite is because if Africa unites, you have 2 billion people. It would be the second or the first largest nation in the world of population. Right now it's China. But 2 billion Africans would be the biggest, it would be the biggest commercial market in the world, number one. Number two, it would have one of the longest sea coasts in the world, oceans where people can uh, do their fishing and, and all the whole coast of Africa is massive productivity. It would be, it, it, it would have uh, uh, one of the strongest militaries in the world. You take the 54 nations in Africa and combine all of the militaries under one, co one command, you have powerful military, number one. Number two, number three, uh, you would have hydroelectric energy coming from uh, uh, the Niger, the Zambezi, the Congo, the Nile, the Orange River, powerful rivers that dominate the continent. I mean, there, you, so many things would be possible. We could travel from Nigeria to Kenya without a visa. 
I mean, right now in, in the African continent, it's a crazy thing. As a, as a U.S. citizen, I can go to Ethiopia without a visa. I go to Ethiopia without a visa, but if you go with me, when you get to the airport, they say, where's your visa? You are you born of the continent, you know what I'm saying? It's crazy, man. It's like, oh, wait a minute, where's my, where, where, where's, where? no, no, so Chima, where's so Chima? No, no, he's, they got him back there, right? Because he's from Africa. I mean, that's crazy. You go to Zambia the same way, Zimbabwe. Why do we have all these restrictions on Africa? That's the that's a problem. There should be one passport. It should say Africa. And if you have one passport that says Africa, it gives you access to the entire continent for business, for relationships, for interactions, for everything. Can you imagine if you start a, a business in Nigeria, you can you can now have that business in everywhere, every part of the continent. That's that's the brilliance of the United States of Africa. But you know what? I have argued with this. I even wrote a book on Pan-Africanism and I, I decried the fact that I could not get, in 2004, 2005, I was at a meeting that was led by President Obasanjo in Abuja, Nigeria, with a subcommittee of African presidents. And we spoke about this because they, they had been convened to bring in people to talk about. Uh, the United States of Africa, and I talked about it, and only one president really, truly spoke up in support of it right now, and that was President Ward of Senegal. He said, my brothers, if we could have this United States of Africa tomorrow, I will gladly become the governor of Senegal. No other president said, I had two presidents, and, and, and one of them is still a friend of mine, but uh, 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 I believe, but uh, and that's uh, Tabo Mbeki. Tabo Mbeki says, no, we don't want to have a United States of Africa. We just, got, we just got our independence and our freedom, and I can't go to my people now and say, let's have this, let's combine with all these other nations. He said, I, I can't do that. And then the president of that time um, um, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Ethiopia, uh, said the same thing, Melis. He said, no, he said, uh, uh, Ethiopia is an old nation. We got our own traditions. We don't want to be United States of Africa. But several of the other presidents said, we believe it will happen. It has to happen, but it cannot happen now. And, and it should happen. This was 2005, I think, when we had that meeting. They said it should happen by, 2000, uh, tw by 2017. 2017 is long gone. They, no, no, they, and they're all out of office. Yeah, Mel is uh, Zanawi, that's from Ethiopia. He was the one. He says, no, they're all out of office. They're all gone. So, so now the, the question for me then is how do we bring into existence the United States of Africa? And I think you hit the nail uh, on the head when you said uh, that in order to, to do this, we have to change the mentality. But it can't just start at the top. It has to be a mass groundswell among the masses of people. It's the kind of thing that Jume Fai, the Senegalese uh, intellectual, and uh, I call him a great thinker, is doing. He has a whole web, his, his whole web presence is about the United States of Africa. He's trying to bring it into existence among the masses of people. But he has many, there are many contradictions because there are people who are Muslims, there are people who are Marxists, and they're all fighting. And I told him, you can't do it that way. It has to be, look, we have to have one African ideology for this. And that ideology has to be, you believe in the United States of Africa, you believe that African people uh, should uh, have references uh, from their own uh, history and culture, you believe in the United, uh, 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 you believe in uh, uh, protecting the smallest ethnic communities in the African continent. Because if we protect the smallest ethnic communities, then we won't have to worry about the larger ones. We won't have to worry about discrimination. In any society, that's what you do. You give protection to the minorities. 
if you give protection to the minorities and you give them all the rights, then the other people. But if you give rights to the larger ethnic groups and not to the minorities, you're going to have discrimination. You're going to have separation. You have all kinds of things. You can't do that. So Africa, United States of Africa, has to protect the minorities in Africa. That is the first thing. If you do that, then you, we can create this thing. Okay, so I am fully on board with the concept of United States of Africa, but there are fundamental challenges to this goal. Uh, you know, how yes. do we address the issue of language and other remnants of uh, colonial structure? You know, for example, you know, I learn about Pan Africanism and Afrocentricity from people like you. And I went through primary school in Nigeria, secondary school in Nigeria, and part of my university in Nigeria. And this was never taught in, in the school. It was never in the curriculum. So there are a lot of uh, structural issues, you know. So how do we address these challenges? Moving well, you, you, yeah, you, you are, you are very right, and you, and you, you pointed out a big problem. And one of the ways that we have to do that is that we've got to have national will. But that's why I'm saying that it has to be broadly in the masses. Uh, because the top leadership, uh, it seems to me, don't have the will to do it, I, I, except in some instances now. I mean, I'm seeing some good things. I mean, as I and I believe this. Uh, I saw in, uh, I think Obasanjo, for example, believed it at the time, but I don't know. I mean, uh, he never brought it to bear, even in, in Nigeria. And, and I think the masses have to be taught. It, take, for example, um, uh, what is going on now in uh, Liberia. In Liberia, they have now decided that every uh, school, that the schools should teach um, Pan-Africanism. And not only Pan-Africanism, but, the, but uh, they should have departments of diaspora studies. The African studies that will connect African people to other African people. And, and, and this has to be done everywhere because we have in the United States departments of African-American studies, but we also need these departments of African-American studies in the United States to become Pan-African because we have populations uh, in Brazil, uh, 100 million black people live in Brazil. We have, we have populations in Colombia, 30% of the population of Colombia in South America is African. And these people, uh, we have, we don't talk much about it, and we have to. We have to bring them into the fold. We have to bring the people in Venezuela and Ecuador and per Peru um, into the African. They, they're Africans. You got you got Afro Iraqi people living in Basra, been there for a thousand years. We got to bring those people into the fold. There's a large African diaspora. The Miss Universe from Iceland a year or two ago was an African. Bring her into the fold. There are many, many people, you see? So we have a vast world population that has been separated, segregated, uh, factionalized, uh, ethnicized. And so we've got to bring, we have to have a big tent. And the big tent cannot be based on religion. It has to be based on just small principles. We believe in the United uh, 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 States of Africa. We believe Africa should be one continental uh, country. And we believe that all Africans uh, should be uh, able to go and live anywhere on the continent they want to. Uh, and we also believe that uh, uh, we should protect the minority rights of all African people. And then, of course, all the other things will come into place. We already have a there are, there's already an African parliament, for example. There's, I mean, the, the, the AU has already established an African parliament. We already have um, uh, ideas about language. The, the language, we, they have five languages now. Five languages that are official languages of the continent. Uh, uh, Kiswahili, uh, English, French, uh, uh, Portuguese, and, um, and Arabic. I mean, those are those are the, and you can have a country with four or five languages. I mean, India has more than four or five. Um, you know, I mean, uh, uh, in, the, in in Russia, uh, right now they only have one, but 
before when it was Soviet Union, they had several uh, major languages. Ukrainian was a language, you see. Uh, uh, they, they had, um, so, so, so these things are possible. Uh, in, in, in Canada, they have uh, French and English are both lang uh, official languages. If you see a document, it's in both languages. And, and we can do that. We can have, if it's in, you know, certain parts of Africa, you can have the Arabic and, and, and other languages and so forth. You can do that, you see. We can overcome all those kind of problems, but we got to first believe in the, in the idea that we, and we would be in a big country. Africa would then not be, right now we have um, 27 of the poorest countries in the world are in Africa. But if we had the United States of Africa, it would be one of the top uh, richest countries in the world. That, that's that's. I mean, it would be like it would be like number five. You see what I mean? So so all that. I mean, there's no reason for. I mean, I'm saying this, and there may be people listening to me. But there's no reason for Niger, for example, which is mainly desert, to have uh, its own air force. I mean, why? Well, there's no need for that. If you're in a big country and you're next to Nigeria or you're next to uh, Ghana or Burkina Faso, so wh why not just combine all these things? There's no reason for us to spend extra money for this and that and so on. But we do need to build highways and railways and train. We need to be able to travel through the continent. One day I would love to drive, you know, all the way from Casablanca to Cape Town. I mean, what, what, what kind of experience? I mean, that's a world experience right there on the continent. You know, I mean, if I could drive from Monrovia all the way to Nairobi, I mean, this is, this is, that's what you, when you look, when we began to learn each other, because in the United States, that's what happens. People who live in Maine, they can drive to California. And they see so many different things. They learn so many different things. The, the languages, the accents, the, the, uh, it's all different. That's important. Uh, so talking about United States of Africa, you know, Gaddafi was very instrumental in advancing African nationalism, you know, among the leadership hierarchies in African governments. And among his efforts is the pro he proposed for African currency, you know, that is pegged to gold. You know, can you talk about this you know, Gaddafi's efforts and this currency. Uh... Well, I think it's a good point. I mean, uh, we have always had this problem. I mean, since we since 1884 and 85, we've had this problem. But uh, there has been a proposal that we have uh, one currency called the Afro. It is the Afro. And everybody has the Afro. We all use the Afro. It could be pegged to gold. Of course, there is so much gold in Africa. It could be pegged to anything. We could peg it to uh, petroleum. We, we, we could certainly uh, peg it to uranium. Uh, you, it could be pegged. Africa has abundance of many different minerals and so on that you can say, well, you know, it could be pegged here. Remember that in ancient times, many things were pegged to cowrie shells. I mean, you know, you know, you give me so many cowrie shells and I, I give you so many goats. I mean, there were always, I mean, we, we, that can be done. But the problem, of course, is that there are now several countries that are tied to the franc, to the French money. And these countries are held by the throat because France would not exist if they did not have all the wealth of Côte d'Ivoire, of, uh, of Guinea, of Mali, uh, of all these uh, countries uh, that have uh, using the French franc. But the French franc, uh, uh, sets the rates for these uh, currencies. Not only sets the rate for the currencies, but tell the countries how much of the franc they can use, how much money is available for you, and then they make the money for. So it, th that's that's a colonial system that has to be broken. And until that system is broken, we will not have independence. You, France. France has that control. And everybody that I know of who knows e economics have talked about it, that the control of the French, of the economies of the French speaking African nations is the worst system of colonialism that we know of right now. Do you think we can really cut these colonial ties if France is highly dependent on these countries for its survival? So 
it will be almost impossible to cut these ties unless it will result to war or some other. Obviously, there are there has been if you even Ivory Coast. If you go back in history of Ivory Coast, there have been several assassinations that people attribute to France, you know, and other things, assassination of their leaders. So do you think we can really cut the ties with uh, countries like France that are highly de dependent on these countries? Well, that's a deep question. It can be done, but it will result in great... Uh, it will it will result in conflict, but but I tell you what, just recently uh, the country of Mali uh, announced that they wanted all the French out within seventy two hours, and uh, we don't know what the results of this will be. But that was this last week. The Mali uh, leadership, under the new leadership, said we want nothing to. We don't want any French soldiers here. We don't want French anywhere here because the French were supposed to be fighting to keep the jihadists out and they have not been successful. We want them out of here. Well, uh, but France has a lot of, a lot of at stake in Mali and a lot in stake in Côte d'Ivoire. In Côte d'Ivoire, uh, they basically own the downtown of Abidjan. Uh, the, the market, the, the French uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, people uh, own uh, lots of Mali. So they don't want to leave. I mean, that's that's a, a basic thing, but uh, it, it will take strong African leadership, but African leadership that is mentally prepared to fight and maybe to suffer uh, as they have caused Haiti and the uh, Caribbean to suffer. Uh, that's what the French did when, uh, for, and it's been going on for a long time. I mean, the defeat of the um, of the French army by. Uh, Desaline in 1804, that's a long time ago, 1804 caused the French uh, and the European powers, including uh, the American nation, uh, to basically abandon Haiti and not to trade with it. So we won't trade with you. We won't have any inaction. You defeated a white nation. We are not going to do anything. You're going to just suffer out there by yourself. So that's what that that will happen in West Africa with the Frank. If uh, the Africa, if ECOWAS was not uh, powerful enough uh, to at least carry on trade with Niger and uh, and uh, Togo and uh, Gabon and all those countries, and I mean Gabon has enough wealth to underwrite anything uh, mm -hmm. that they they are doing, uh, the French are doing, but but because they're so tied to the French and the French are so tied to Gabon, which is one of the richest countries per capita in the world, but the people are still poor, um, is uh, is crazy. It's like we, we can't break out of this thing, of this dependency, but we can do it if we ha or become Afrocentric, okay? Okay, in conclusion, uh, just yes. uh, the last uh, uh, question, I always say that you know each African president has to be willing to die for their country, because if, France, if France come to you and say, we want you to do this. If not, you know, they, they, they're always scared of assassination. People will say, oh, they're worried they will be assassinated. Yeah. So if France come to me and say, you have to do this, and I say, no, I want the interests of my people, and they come, go to my brother, my brother says the same thing, then they will have to stop. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's the, uh, and just, I just, just uh, what advice would you give, you know, people like me, you know, in Africa and the youth well, about? I mean, I'm encouraged by young people like you. I'm, I'm deeply encouraged by it. I mean, you know, um, we, we have had in our history incredible insights and brilliant people. Uh, before he was killed, uh, Tony Sankara invited me to Wagadougou to an organization that he was sponsoring called the Institute of the Black People. And this institute was uh, a, a Pan-African organization where all the information around the world about black people would be collected in one institute and would be translated in many different languages, including indigenous languages, and spread so that we would, so that my works in English will be uh, in uh, Portuguese, in Igbo, in Hausa, in, in Efik, and all these languages all over, the, that they, we would share information, that that would bring into existence a common set of information 
that was a brilliant idea. But, uh, but then again, there was a reaction to him. But I think that now we have more and more young people who are willing to say, you know what? No, this is we. The, the Chinese have come. The Chinese have uh, recreated themselves in 40 years. China has become the most dominant nation on the earth, mainly because of the recreation of the people in terms of their own love for their own culture. That's a very powerful thing. And unfortunately, we may have to deal with China in the future. That's what I'm seeing when I'm traveling on the African continent. Chinese are everywhere and they're buying up things like the Europeans did. So now you've got that issue because we have not organized and we have not come together as one nation. They can move from Ghana to Nigeria to Guinea to Senegal to Mali they're, they're, and Ethiopia. They're everywhere and they can do this because we don't have one policy. We have one government policy, one African government that says, oh no, you, you can't move into this, this state, this state of uh, Senegal, no. You can't move to the state of Guinea and, and you're doing, no, 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 you're the same people. So, and you have one understanding of the whole thing. Then you just have one policy, one government, you know, one Navy, one army, uh, uh, you know, this, this is, uh, we have to do this because if we don't do it, we're being picked off one little nation at a time. There's no reason for Guinea to exist or, or um, a Guinea-Bissau or Gabon. What, why, why these, these, they are not able to function in a way that uh, they can ward off or keep out uh, European powers or Chinese uh, or Asian powers coming in. I mean, you, some of these, some of these Chinese. I mean, Chinese have bought up thousands of acres in Zimbabwe, thousands of acres. They grow their food for the chi for China, not for Zimbabwe, but they own territory in Zimbabwe to raise food for China. Think about that. Well, why not? I mean, why not have a deal where? Okay, well, you know, maybe you can send 50% to China, but 50% of the rice you produce have to be used here in Zimbabwe. I, I don't know why we haven't dealt with them that way. But that's our, it's, that's our problem. And that's the problem of the weakness of the ideology. The, the strongest weapon that the enemies of Africa, uh, the strongest weapon they have against us, I believe, is uh, maybe much like, it was Cabral who said it was our weakness, our our but our I say our cultural and, and psychological weakness to stand for Africa. So no, and that's one of the things. Even though I had many problems later in his reign, I still praise Wad for telling the French no. If you cannot give us the majority share of what you dig out of the ground, we rather for it to stay in the ground. Don't dig it up. We'll, we'll, we'll wait till another generation stronger than us will be able to say, no, we're not going to give you our uranium. We're not going to give you our petroleum. We'll leave it in the ground for another generation. That, that's, the, that's the will we have to have, okay? All right. It okay. will come. Right. It is kind of victory, Do sir. Dr. Right. Asante, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you much for your time. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much.